Do you really think this is going to help? How would you tell people that this is You first, first, first. How would you tell this? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on that. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Once again, we are back to take a look at Roger from Mud Fossil U and how badly wrong he can get particle physics, which, I mean, granted, it's not the most simple of topics, but still, he gets it really, really, really wrong. Anyway, last time we left off, we had been told that electrons were made of dark and light halves, and that the light half is glowy and sets things on fire, but only the dark half has mass, I think? It's very hard to follow. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's not true, but we're going to continue with that, so take it away, Roger, I guess. The electron, it's a, it's a field structure. I don't know how to explain it other than that. Yes, it is. That's what particles are in the first place. Tau, I believe, is a couple of muons and only one electron. Well, it's not, because that's not enough mass, and it's too much electric charge. If that were the case, the tau would be much lighter and have three times the electrical charge it actually has. We're at the level of you don't need any training in quantum electrodynamics to see this bullshit. You just need to be able to add and subtract numbers. Normally you have a couple of electrons with a couple of muons, that's a photon. Then photons would have even more mass than a tau and even more charge. But they have neither of both. It's like trying to make a table out of a musical chord. It doesn't make any sense. These aren't things that can be made up of each other. Or you have one electron and one muon. That's an electron, a really an electron. So electrons are a muon and an electron, which is a muon and an electron, which is a muon and an electron, which is a muon and an electron to infinity. Anyone else think that maybe electrons don't have infinite charge and mass, or is it just me? But when you have a tau and it's very heavy, which it would have to be if it's made of electrons, and uh, electrons now suddenly have infinite mass, because each electron is actually made up of an electron and a muon, and that electron is therefore also made up of an electron and a muon. I think it has more muons, because that's where all the weight is. Almost 100% of the weight is there. Right, but apparently if it has even one electron, it has infinite muons, and so it has infinite mass. So all anything needs is just one electron, and now it's both infinitely massive and infinitely negatively charged. And you might say I'm not being charitable, and of course that's not what Roger thinks, but the thing is, it's the actual outcome of his very unambiguous statement that electrons are made of a muon and an electron. And really, this is the guy who thinks that fossilized trees are the hair of giants, so I don't think the fact that it's absurd on the face of it is a barrier for Roger. If anything, that seems to be his general frame of mind. Just constant nonsense that wouldn't pass a basic logic test. Less than 5% is in the electron neutrino portion. Oh wait, so are taus made up of a muon and a bunch of electron neutrinos? Because that wouldn't give them infinite mass, but neutrinos have no way to attach themselves to a muon, since again, they don't interact with the electromagnetic force. Just trying to figure out how internally incoherent this idea is is basically already a debunk. I don't even need to look up fancy physics. I can just point out that, in fact, no, electrons have finite mass in charge, so they're not an infinite number of muons. So this, and then it goes on from here to talk all about electron positrons and how long they last and their stabilities and so forth. And then the muons, is, we showed a muon. The muon is the black ball. Well, that was the claim, but muons have just as much electric charge, which to Roger apparently means burning. So that doesn't really make sense. Shouldn't they be just as burny as electrons? Except I guess they're also made up of electrons or something, or they're part of an electron. It's getting hard to keep track. And a tau, as I said, I think is a couple of blacks and a white. Yeah, maybe he should come up with some better phrasing for this. And they're talking about an annihilation and positron pairs and the properties of all the leptons and how, how long they're stable for. Because they decay almost instantaneously. These, um, the uh, muon, uh, sterile muon, decays like instantaneously. And the electron shower as well. So let's look at that right now. Imagine that, looking at the actual experimentally verified properties of things one wants to talk about. I feel like we could have started with that, but what do I know? I'm just a dinosaur. Roger here is an unparalleled genius who is leaving dunderheads like Newton, Feynman, Einstein, and Lyell in the dust. Okay, in order to understand lepton universality, we have to understand what a lepton is. Well, they are collectively these particles. 
Note, they're those particles and their associated neutrinos. Definitionally, they're elementary particles of half-integer spin that do not undergo strong interactions. That is, they can't interact with a strong nuclear force. Now, leptons and quarks are the basic building blocks of matter, they think. And we've been given literally nothing to think that's wrong. They are seen as the elementary particles, the most basic particles. There's six leptons in the present structure the electron, muon, and tau particles, and their associated neutrinos. Let's see if the fact that that sentence indicates that neutrinos aren't the same particles as the associated non-neutrino leptons sinks in. I'm thinking he won't figure that out, and instead is about to directly contradict what he just read from the source he himself is using. Alright, so they have a neutrino that turns into these particles, electron, muon, and tau. No, the associated neutrinos don't turn into their associated particles. They're associated because interactions involving those more massive particles tend to emit particular neutrinos. So, for an example, in a beta minus decay, a neutron turns into a proton, an electron, and an anti electron neutrino. The electron neutrino, in this case the antimatter version, is associated with a decay that produces an electron. Bizarrely, neutrinos can oscillate between different types of neutrinos, which is a big part of why they're so mysterious compared to most other elementary particles, but they can't simply change from being a neutrino into some other non neutrino type of lepton or vice versa, however you want to look at it. Also no, and for the same basic reasons. The different varieties of the elementary particles are commonly called flavors, and the neutrinos here are considered to have distinctly different flavors. Here they're giving them a certain mass and a certain energy and calling them an electron, a muon, and a tau. Yes, because those particles are measured to have those masses, and what we call particles with half integer spin, those masses, and a minus one electrical charge, is an electron, a muon, and a tau. Lepton. Now, these leptons are pictured as particles. And I agree with that. They're all particles, yes. The tau is 3,477 times as massive as the electron. It might be possible. Yeah, it might be possible that the insanely precise calculation and measurements that I can guarantee Roger does not understand might actually have found values for the properties of leptons. I guess that's the thing that could have happened. It's not impossible. But none of these particles show internal structure. I can agree with that too. I'm going to speak to Roger directly here for a moment. No, Roger, you f can't. You have spent your whole goddamn video talking about how these things are made up of smaller things and how they have two different sides and how they f spin around each other. That's literally the opposite of not having an internal structure. The entire thing up till now has been point after point attempting to show that all these leptons, which, Roger, you can't even figure out how many there are, have internal structure. Stop pissing on me and telling me it's rain. I can f***ing tell the difference. Size may not be a meaningful word to describe them. I agree with that too, because they can glow and they don't have to have a size to have some glowy energy. I, I can't explain it. I can't explain it might be the most accurate thing Roger has ever said about anything in his entire time on YouTube. Because not only can he not explain any of this, I don't even think it's explainable. I'm not sure that any of this nonsense rises to the level of coherent thought. In fact, I know some of it does not. This is pretty interesting. 347 times as massive as the electron. Now, I don't know, they, I, I don't think they understand what an electron is, and I don't think I understand what either of all of these are, because they are nothing but different, um, it's the same particles under different pushing and shoving energies. I don't even know what a pushing or shoving energy would mean in this context, but I'm sure that Roger will tell us, and it will make all the sense. And this 3477 divided by 2 is pretty damn close. 1,738.5 is close to what? The ratio of the mass of a proton to an electron, which is 1,836? That's the only thing I can think of, but close only counts in hand grenades and horseshoes. Does that mean Roger thinks that a tau is actually two protons stuck together or something? I mean, that seems dumb enough to be something he would think. I'm gonna, I gotta tell you, I just burst into hysterical laughter when I'm reading this. Oh, apparently no, we don't get an explanation. Just change to a new tab, and one about a topic even more advanced than the previous ones that Roger has already failed to understand. They're trying to explain the hints for lepton flavor university evaluation. Well, they're proposing some new generations of leptoquarks. 
I'm going to cut down to where it just gets hysterical. I am extremely confident that Roger understood none of that title, and that is what he finds hysterical. He seems to think that if it doesn't make sense to him, it must be absurd. They're extending the standard monocle particles content by an electro quark, a muo quark, and a tau quark. We show that after taking into account other constraints, such as those originating from electroweak precision observable observables and delta F equals two processes, it is possible to provide a combined explanation for all these hints of lepton flavor university violation. <laughs> this, it just doesn't work. What doesn't work? Because what we're talking about here is three new bosons that would interact both with quarks and leptons, which is hinted at because sometimes the way quarks decay to produce leptons doesn't perfectly line up with the standard model, which could be solved by the existence of things such as an electro quark, a muo quark, and a tau quark. But I don't think Roger even believes in quarks, and I don't think he knows what a boson is, which, to remind everyone, is a quantum particle with integer spin, and they are the particles that mediate the fundamental forces of the universe. Moreover, we find that, listen to this, we find that the presence of the tau quark can generate a dimensional six, whatever this thing is. Yep, I was right. He doesn't understand it, so it must be nonsense. Octo upper nine operator via off-shelf photon penguin diagrams. Pro tip, the fact that scientists sometimes give things funny names doesn't make those things fake, lies, fabrications, or useless. Another fun fact, penguin diagrams are a particular group of Feynman diagrams which describe interactions that violate charge parity symmetry, which states that you shouldn't be able to tell the difference between our universe and one where all particles are swapped for antiparticles and whose spatial coordinates are flipped. It just so happens that they vaguely look like penguins without a head. So scientists, being people who like a joke as much as the next person, decided to call them penguin diagrams. I'm sorry that the man who took seriously the idea that the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park was a real thing might find that absurd. Okay, my outstanding friends, Roger, once again, and uh, I am calling for your help to collab collab or to verify <laughs> one way or the other whether this was true or not. This is supposed to be in near Gumption, Texas, and it is called the Mysterious Flesh Pit. And this, I, I, I know what it is if it's real. And I've studied the mud fossils, and it, this, apparently this was a tourist attraction. And there was a big area here, which was the main bath and the entrance area. And they had, like, tunnels running into it and so forth. I'm going to show you what I think it is biologically, because they called it a, giant, a super organism. Supposedly, this was dedicated as a national park by Jimmy Carter and it was there and it, it even shows the, the, the how much they charge to get in and not everything here and this is supposedly from mysterious flesh pit national park I don't know and um, which together with the muo quark contribution further improves the global fit to be equals not an equal sign there but okay <laughs> whatever these little gooey things are oh my god They've explained it. That really explains it. Laughing at things you don't understand isn't an argument that those things aren't true. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I understood all of that. I didn't. But the difference is that I know I don't know all of what's being said. And so I know that I fundamentally cannot comment on the plausibility of it. But Roger, on the other hand, gets to just hand wave dismiss anything that doesn't make immediate intuitive sense to him. But hey, what can I expect from the guy who thinks that Petra was carved into still wet flesh that somehow turned into sandstone? Okay, as I have always said, all of this is nothing more than bodily tissue from just some gigantic creature. These are nothing more than muscle fibers, and these are sarcomeres, they call them. Okay, this is, I think, either part three or four of the particle physics explanation of leptons, neutrinos, subatomic particles. First, neutrinos are leptons, but also, I'm not the one editing these cuts in his video. The only thing I'm doing is cutting a bit of dead air time on either end of them. This is the actual flow of his video. And a proton is not a big ball like that with a few leptons. Yeah, it has no leptons, being entirely made up of quarks, namely two up quarks and a down quark. It is all dipoles, all like this. Every one of these together in 1823 
it is what they consider a stable proton. Wrong. Just so wrong. But we've been over it. Protons aren't made up of electrons, or they'd have a negative charge. Instead, they're made up of two quarks, which themselves have a charge of plus two-thirds, and a down quark, which has a charge of negative one-third, giving a total charge of positive one. Because remember kids, electric charge is a conserved quantity. You can't simply pretend it doesn't exist. And if you add 1,800 electrons to something, you can't just ignore all the negative charge that each one adds. At that point, it doesn't really... It's, it's, it's comfortable with that many particles all glued together at the same time. But each one of these is a dipole, meaning it's a bar magnet. Again, no, the dipole moment of an electron is based entirely on relative motion. It's not just intrinsic, and if a bunch of electrons were just haphazardly somehow stuck into a ball, even though electrons don't interact with a strong nuclear force, so it's impossible anyway, the net magnetic field, even if the object were to move around, would probably be cancelled out on average. But what wouldn't happen is that you could get a positively charged proton. But also, Roger is trying to say that these electrons are surrounding an even more massive particle, which he sometimes identifies as a muon. So leaving aside here his idea of infinite muon electrons, that would give the protons the mass of 1800 or so electrons plus a muon. But it doesn't have that mass. It only has the mass of the electrons. So what's the deal with the central thing's mass? I suspect no explanation is forthcoming. So they are not just one big ball that they smash together and they see all bits and pieces. They're, they're two big balls like this, and when they smash them, they see all these little pieces. Sometimes they see a chunk like this. No, they don't. No one has ever seen a group of three electrons stuck together fly off of a proton. A proton can capture an electron and become a neutron and spit out an electron neutrino, though. But that's what gets spit out, an electron neutrino. Not three electrons stacked together wearing a trench coat. There's four or five of them together. Sometimes they see one. Sometimes they actually see the bar magnet split in half, and the white goes one way and the black goes the other way. That's called electron and muon neutrinos, and they create showers. That's going to be a big old citation needed from me. I don't think anyone has ever seen a proton bar magnet split into a shower of neutrinos. Now, she's going to be talking about this physical anomaly vanishes. Well, no, it didn't vanish. They just figured a way of saying, oh... By the way, the she is Dr. Sabine Hossenfelder. I figured I'd say it since apparently Roger doesn't seem to care to identify the person whose video he's about to rely on for his own. When you read the, the, the verbiage that they put behind these explanations, and nobody in their right mind is ever going to look at it. Yes, they will. The people who are actually trained in this field will look at it and understand it. The fact that a field is technical, and so the technical literature in that field is relatively opaque to lay people, doesn't mean that it's meaningless. It means that most people don't know how to understand it. I find paleontology papers not terribly hard to understand, but when I even describe them in any detail, most people I know can't follow it. It's not because I'm some super genius, it's because I made it my business to understand such things. Roger could make it his business to understand geology or physics, but chooses not to do either, and instead, just laugh at how much he doesn't understand while also telling us that some cave is a vagina because it kind of looks like one. That, my friends, is a vagina. And you're going to say, oh, Roger, come on. Somebody must have carved that. I said, no, don't you forget the seam we talked about. You see that? That is a vagina. And I understand, you know, I'm pretty good with vaginas. I understand the... Uh, <laughs> the uh, tissue uh, types, <laughs> and th I understand it pretty well. So watch this. Here, here's This is Sabine Hassenfelder. This is her channel. Here she's saying here. My apologies to Roger. He did actually say her name. The beam meson anomaly has disappeared in recent data from the Large Hadron Collider, LHC for short. It was the particle physics anomaly which attracted the most attention in the past years based on a slight violation of a symmetry known as lepton universality. In a recent analysis of data from the LHCB experiment, the anomaly is gone and the results are compatible with the standard model. Time to talk about symmetry, which I've already touched on, but let's go a bit more in depth. Let's say you met an alien electrician, and you and he, for some reason, needed to work on an electrical motor. Now, you don't know which sign convention his alien culture uses for electrical charge. Maybe it's the same as yours. But maybe it's actually the opposite, and he considers protons to be negatively charged and electrons positively charged. Or maybe he uses some other dichotomy from his culture, like high and low. Can you two still work on the same motor without being able to know each other's sign convention for electrical charge? Well, it turns out, yes. 
You see, positive and negative charges are just alike. They have the same strength in the proton and the electron, and they both attract the other and repel the same charge. So there's no real way to distinguish between our convention or another, but significantly, if you were transported to a world where the only difference was that the charge of the particles in that world were flipped, you'd really have no way of knowing, presuming all of your own charges were flipped, too, in the interest of you not dying. It would look completely identical. This is a parity or symmetry. It turns out that there are many symmetries in physics, although in some cases they are linked. For example, in some cases you may need to flip more than one thing, such as CPT symmetry, which states that there is no way to tell the difference between our universe and one in which we swap matter for antimatter, swap one spatial axis, and also swap the directionality of time as it is felt by subatomic particles. But there are less extreme and all-encompassing symmetries. One of them is lepton flavor symmetry. The symmetry states that the ratio of decay probability of different lepton flavors that is, the different leptons, such as the muon and tau, should be very close to one. The alleged violation Dr. Hassenfelder was speaking of was a disagreement between this prediction and the results of some experiments, which showed a violation at 3.1 sigma, which is not enough to confirm a breaking of lepton flavor symmetry, but is enough to warrant further investigation. All right, let me just imagine. <laughs> I looked up this article. It is, there's nobody ever in history could possibly look at this and read it and understand even anything about it. Once again, that something goes over Roger's head is not indication that it's incomprehensible. So they came, came up with so much verbiage that by the time you're done, you're, oh yeah, this must be right. <laughs> or, you know, they reported their results. Turns out physics is complicated. I don't understand all of it. But I am not so hubristic as to think that means that it's nonsense. This anomaly had been widely reported as a possible sign of physics beyond the standard model, often by portraying it as a hint for a new force of nature. But <coughs> LHCB didn't find the anomaly doesn't mean it's gone for good, because LHCB is only one of several experiments that claim to see it. So the patient isn't dead, but a life support and the machines are beeping loudly. There are two other anomalies in particle physics which have recently attracted attention. One is the mu G minus two measurement that slightly deviates from the theoretical prediction. It was first found in Brookhaven 20 years ago and then confirmed at Fermilab two years ago. This one has never been a particularly convincing anomaly because physicists have long suspected that the reason for the discrepancy between prediction and observation isn't the theory, but rather that it's extremely hard to calculate the predicted value from the theory. The third anomaly that you may have seen in the headlines last year is a measurement of the mass of the W boson. I talked about this in more detail in an earlier video. In this case, the anomaly doesn't come from a new measurement, but from a new analysis of old data. The this is the key. I know you, nowhere in the world would anybody look at this and come up with a conclusion. That's why it's, they keep changing, changing, changing. Yeah, imagine that. Scientists changing their ideas when their ideas don't fit experiment. Except in these cases, we're not quite at that point. These anomalies are still being worked on, and some of them, as Dr. Hassenfelder said, may simply be due to the fact that in some areas the actual prediction of the standard model is hard to figure out. In some other areas, it may well be that there are new forces, and in others it might just be an error in measurement. But in focusing on these anomalies, one of the big things that Roger misses is how exactly most results fit the predictions of the standard model. One famous example is the prediction and subsequent discovery of the Higgs boson. Its existence was postulated as the boson that gave elementary particles like leptons their mass, and it was predicted to have a particular mass, spin, and charge, namely 126 giga electron volts divided by the speed of light squared, zero spin, and zero charged. Then it was discovered, and the predictions matched the experimental observations beautifully. That's the typical result. It's just that that's not attention-getting, so it doesn't get headlines. Instead of simply laughing at people who have dedicated their entire professional lives to understanding the stuff, and who actually are able to understand the papers that Roger says he cannot, imagine if he bothered to actually learn something analysis supposedly has a very small uncertainty which brings it in tension with other sets of data. I suspect that later this year other groups will have a few things to criticize on that data analysis. I got a few things to criticize right now, Sabine, and I would love to discuss it with you. First, I don't think Roger is on a first name basis with Dr. Hassenfelder, so perhaps he should call her by her title and surname. Second, there is as much point in Roger speaking to her about particle physics as there is in discussing wine tasting with a toddler. The toddler will at best be confused about things like bouquet, airing, sweetness versus dryness, etc. And frankly, it's not really worth explaining because a toddler isn't going to get it anytime soon, 
And the people who are off enjoying their wine will be better off ignoring the toddler anyway, since they won't be able to contribute meaningfully. Except this is worse, because Roger, who seems to be the intellectual equivalent of a toddler, but one who managed to acquire basic literacy skills, is also convinced that not only is what the adult's saying something that he doesn't understand, but that it actually doesn't make sense, even to them, and so they are wrong. That wine isn't dry, because it's clearly wet. If you touch it, you get wet. So he is loudly trying to get the attention of the adults to explain to them why they're so dumb to say that a particular wine is dry. Roger, if by some miracle you watch this video, there is no way in hell anyone who's actually working in the field of particle physics research would be doing anything but wasting their time in talking particle physics with a man who thinks that a statue in the catacombs of Paris is actually a real bleeding person walking through a wall. Okay, my outstanding friends, very quick today. What do we see here? Somebody walking out of a wall. This is the catacombs. And what is this right here? Well, that looks like blood to me. What is that right there? It looks like blood to me. What is that right there? It looks like blood to me. What is this right under here? It looks like blood to me. Does it mean anything? Well, let's see. Because I have actual evidence. Camera artifacts in Rod from Australia's cell phone pictures aren't evidence. So, I, I see no reason whatsoever for you not to discuss it with me. I'll be very kind and pleasant and, 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 you know, we could have a nice time talking about it. Yeah, the guy who's been mocking everyone smarter than he is while referring to literally nothing of any scientific value, who's been ignoring every article's text that he bothered to bring up, would of course be very nice to talk to about this topic. It definitely wouldn't be an infuriating tirade of complete nonsense like infinite muon regression electrons. I'm sure that would never happen. The best Roger could hope for is the equivalent of this sadly fictional letter from the Smithsonian. Paleoanthropology Division, Smithsonian Institute, 207 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C., 2008. Dear Sir, Thank you for your latest submission to the Institute, labeled 211-D, Layer 7, next to the clothesline post, Hominid Skull. We have given this specimen a careful and detailed examination, and regret to inform you that we disagree with your theory that it represents conclusive proof of the presence of early man in Charleston County, two million years ago. Rather, it appears that what you have found is the head of a Barbie doll of the variety one of our staff who has small children believes to be the Malibu Barbie. It is evident that you have given a great deal of thought to the analysis of this specimen, and you may be quite certain that those of us who are familiar with your prior work in the field were loath to come to contradiction with your findings. However, we feel there are a number of physical attributes of the specimen which might have tipped you off to its modern origin. One, the material is molded plastic. Ancient hominid remains are typically fossilized bone. Two, the cranial capacity of the specimen is approximately 9 cubic centimeters, well below the threshold of even the earliest identified proto-hominids. Three, the dentition pattern on the skull is more consistent with the common domesticated dog than it is with the ravenous man-eating Pliocene clams you speculate roamed the wetlands during that time. The latter finding is certainly one of the more intriguing hypotheses you have submitted in your history with this institution, but the evidence seems to weigh rather heavily against it. Without going into much detail, let us just say that A, the specimen looks like the head of a Barbie doll that a dog chewed on, and B, clams don't have teeth. It is with feelings tinged with melancholy that we must deny your request to have the specimen carbon dated. This is partly due to the heavy load our lab must bear in its normal operation, and partly due to carbon dating's notorious inaccuracy in fossils of recent geologic record. To the best of our knowledge, no Barbie dolls were produced prior to 1956 AD, and carbon dating is likely to produce wildly inaccurate results. Sadly, we must also deny your request that we approach the National Science Foundation's phylogeny department with the concept of assigning your specimen the scientific name Australopithecus spiferino. Speaking personally, I, for one, fought tenaciously for the acceptance of your proposed taxonomy, but was ultimately voted down because the species name you selected was hyphenated and didn't really sound like it might be Latin. However, we gladly accept your generous donation of this fascinating specimen to the museum. While it is undoubtedly not a hominid fossil, it is nonetheless yet another riveting example of the great body of work you seem to accumulate here so effortlessly. You should know that our director has reserved a special shelf in his own office for the display of specimens you have previously submitted to the institution, and the entire staff speculates daily on what you will happen upon next in your digs at the site you have discovered in your backyard. We eagerly anticipate your trip to our nation's capital that you proposed in your last letter, and several of us are pressing the director to pay for it. We are particularly interested in hearing you expand on your theory surrounding the transpositating filifitration of ferrous ions in a structural matrix that makes the excellent juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex femur you recently discovered take on the deceptive appearance of a rusty 9mm Sears Craftsman automotive crescent wrench. Yours in science, Harvey Rowe, Curator, Antiquities. In other words, Roger is barely worth more than gentle mocking from experts who use his inanity for their own amusement. 
but really, they are probably best off just ignoring him. This is new physics. This is not something, it's just not understood. Everything is a dipole, as I will show you. Oh, I can't wait to be shown. Okay, Sabine talked about lepton flavor university violations. Now, what does that mean? She didn't explain it. She just said, well, they did a whole bunch of calculations, and now they figured out they were wrong, so now they're right. No, she said the anomaly was no longer apparent in the data, and the anomaly had only been hinted at in the first place. But as I said, it was not detected with enough confidence to say that the finding had been confirmed, and it now seems like it was indeed simply a fluke. They didn't just do random math to declare themselves correct. This seems like projection. No, that's how Roger thinks it works to keep his fragile ego intact, because I suspect and I'm not a psychologist here, that Roger deep down knows just how stupid he is and it eats him up inside to know that while he thinks he's the most important person in the history of science, that everyone who knows the first things about the topics he covers knows he's actually possibly one of the world's most absurd people, and that his ideas aren't worth the time it takes to hear them except to do what I'm doing, which is to mock them and also use them as a springboard to talk about things like symmetry, the particle zoo, conservation of charge, etc. <laughs> this is what I always get. Oh, well, now they figured out they were wrong, so now they're right. But then later they figured out they were right the first time, so now they're wrong. But they're really kind of right because it could be anything. And basically, that's how it works. Now, let's fi figure out. They're trying to stay with the standard model, the most extensively tested, confirmed since its inception in the 70s. It's not correct at all. I show you it's not correct. Still waiting. All right, they say it's the most excellent theory of history, but listen to this, what it says. The discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012, the ultimate affirmation as the prevailing theory of particle physics. Nonetheless, it is widely accepted that the standard model cannot be the fundamental theory at all energies. It's not the fundamental theory at all because it's one gigantic positive core and little tiny negatives. It doesn't work that way. They're all dipoles. Something which no data, including these known problems with the standard model, has ever suggested. So they, they admit it can't work for all energies. For instance, listen to this. Oh, I'm listening. It cannot account for the mass of neutrinos. They say, oh, look at all these neutrinos. We have no idea how to get the masses. Yep, that's an open question. But let's not forget that Roger here doesn't know either, and he doesn't even know that neutrinos aren't actually their own corresponding non-neutrino leptons. He actually thinks that there is no difference between an electron and an electron neutrino, even though they have different masses and charges. It can't account for the dominance of matter over antimatter in our universe, which could be right or could be wrong. So it could be right that the standard model cannot account for the dominance of matter over antimatter, or it could be wrong. I mean, does Roger, who rejects the standard model entirely, think that it might actually somehow correctly account for the dominance of matter? How would that work? Why would the standard model fail us at the basics of just what an electron is? but then get something as hard to explain as the prevalence of matter over antimatter correct. Is this supposed to be a broken clock syndrome or something? Even Roger's meta-beliefs about particle physics are incoherent. It can't exist for the, nothing to do with dark matter. They can't figure that out. They can't figure out gravity. Yep, gravity being so weak it basically doesn't exist at the quantum level. So it's really hard to investigate it at that level. It's motivated by these shortcomings. A huge number of extensions of the standard model have been proposed over the years. Well, I have an extension to change it from a big positive to little negatives to one set of particles, and everyone's the same. Okay, but that doesn't work for so many reasons. Just the basic arithmetic doesn't work out, because it violates the conservation of energy, charge, lepton number, etc. Roger's model is crazy on the level of trying to follow a recipe by insisting that really every cup of milk is actually equal to one gallon of milk and three cups of milk, which themselves are, of course, made up of a gallon of milk and three cups of milk. So if you want to bake a cake, you'll need infinite milk, or it really just won't work. And if you point this out, he just says, no, it's only a cup of milk, never noticing the problem. And when you smash it to bits, if you get down to the tiniest particle, you'll be there, which will be a positive and a negative. It's called a Dirac neutrino. Which, for what feels like the millionth time, is not what a Dirac neutrino is, and Roger only thinks that because all he can do is look at pretty pictures, because even basic explanations for lay people are far beyond his capacity to comprehend. If you break that in half, you split it down to the muon and electron shower. See what I mean? Electrons can't be made up of an electron and a muon. It's nonsensical. 
but I guess, what can we expect from the guy who said that meteorites contain blood? Okay, so what would you do if you wanted to determine what's out in space? Well, we'd see what is coming to Earth from space, first of all. Take a look at that stuff. And here's one of these meteorites that came through space, and they found these little pieces here. You see these? They say this is a brand new mineral, never been seen before. You see all these little dots in here? You see this black underneath this, these little flakes? Well, this is a meteorite, and it's an iron-type meteorite. I have one here, iron meteorite. And it's a tiny little one. I know exactly what it is. And it is literally a body part, and so is this. And I'll show you this in the microscope. And then we are going to see the catalase reaction of the actual blood that is still in this meteorite. So motivated by these huge number of shortcomings, there's all kinds of people propose all kinds of things, but nobody's ever come up with anything solid or even been able to display it. I've done both of those things. No, because if he had, he'd have what the actual scientists have, data. Instead, he's just got props. So the large anion corridor searches have yet to produce direct hints for the proposed particles. I show you the particles. I'm beginning to think that he actually believes that the magnets on his desk are actual subatomic particles. I mean, remember, he, based on his own words, seems to think electrons are a half an inch tall. Indirect searches for physics beyond the standard model have become an increasingly important avenue. Well, let's take a look at it. I showed it so many times, it's, it's starting to get really tiring. I'll say. To have nobody ever even ask me a question, and I've submitted this to all these top people that are making all these claims. Look, if you asked a baseball player why he doesn't just take more three-point shots, would it really be surprising if he didn't bother to answer? But that's the boat Roger's in with regards to people like actual theoretical physicists. He's so impossibly wrong that there's really no point in trying to correct him, unless, like me, that's just kind of your thing about the standard model being the most successful model in history, da, da, da. No, it's not. It doesn't account for anything, really. It can't even account for gravity. No model in science accounts for everything, although that's the ultimate goal of physics, a theory for everything. But the fact that all models are incomplete as it stands now does not prevent one of them from being the most successful incomplete model among all the other incomplete models. And Roger has at no point even tried to show why the standard model has failed by using actual measurements. All we have is his word. They say the standard model survives stringent, stringent test at Lepton University, of Lepton University. Universality. It's not the same word as university. At the Atlas. So they're saying, oh, there's no problem with Lepton University. Well, let's see what they have to say. It's, it's short. It's only 4 minutes and 11 seconds long. So let's check this out and see if it did survive and see if I can explain why I think it didn't survive because it can't survive because it doesn't work. I look forward to Roger's upcoming mathematical analysis of the Atlas data. We've just performed a brand new, very precise measurement of something called lepton flavor universality. Keep in mind that a measurement means that there are numbers, units, and error margins. Something that, as far as I know, Roger has never given for anything he's ever claimed. The universality of, of lepton couplings is um, the, the expectation that these leptons are all equally likely to be produced by a W boson, which is the particle responsible for the weak force. I don't think Roger has ever heard of W bosons, because the only boson he's mentioned is the photon, and he somehow thinks those are made of two electrons, which themselves are made of an electron and a muon which is as insane as it sounds. 
I'm not sure that Roger knows what a boson is, but remember, they're fundamental particles with integer spin, and they carry the energy transferred by the fundamental forces. So, so this is a fundamental assumption of the standard model. There's nothing to say that it should be true or should not be true, and therefore we want to test this fundamental assumption as precisely as possible. So what we did the measurement of is the ratio of the, of the W decaying um, to muons and to tau leptons. And this is predicted to happen at the same rate um, in the standard model, and we want to test as precisely as possible if this happens with exactly the same probability. Imagine that. Having an idea and then actually checking to see if it's right? This is like a foreign language to people like Roger, Flat Earthers, and Young Earth Creationists, all of whom are loath to actually test their ideas and then modify them when they are conclusively falsified which they always are. So one of the reasons for carrying out this measurement is that at the previous collider at CERN, the Large Electron-Positron Collider, which operated in the 1990s, they observed a discrepancy in this very same quantity. Yup, but that discrepancy is relatively low confidence and the measurements were less than precise. So it makes sense to try again and see if the discrepancy was real or not. So the way we go about doing this analysis is that muons produce a very distinctive signature in our detector. They interact at various different points and therefore you get little single dots and you can join the dots and form a track. Look at that, collecting data. Maybe Roger should try that sometime. By the way, Roger let this whole thing play, but both for time and copyright reasons, I'm not doing that. Instead, I'm cutting out bits where they say things like why this is important or the differences between different colliders. Tau's all, tau leptons also decay to muons very often, but they do so after flying a certain distance. And therefore, we can look for muons from tau leptons and muons directly from W bosons and look at the displacement from the interaction point to see if they've flown a, a short distance and then been produced or been produced straight away. Wow, they're even checking for confounding variables. So our measurement is of this ratio of the probabilities of a W decaying to a tau divided by the probability of the W decaying to a muon. And you see a value very close to 1 within our uncertainties, and our uncertainty is only 1.3%, which is about half the, the let value, which is a combination of all the four experiments. And therefore, the standard model survives the stringent test of lepton universality. Personally, I'm extremely impressed by the ingenuity of the researchers at CERN, but somehow I think that Roger will simply hand wave it away, which is so sad. I can't state strongly enough how amazing I find the human ability to probe into parts of the universe that are so tiny and obscure that by rights, humans should never be able to know that they even exist. On the other hand, there's people like Roger or Stephen Meyer, who simply ignore any and all reality that they don't like, so they can prop up some idea that they just happen to like for selfish reasons. It's just a denial of the ingenuity and the scientific capacity of humanity to act like that. The scientists who make these breakthroughs deserve better than to simply be laughed at by morons who are morons by choice. Okay, my friends, it doesn't get any clearer than this. The Higgs particles could be the portal, b b portal between us and dark sector that could hide dark matter. Wait, Roger has no commentary? Really? He just cuts to a new thing after the video plays. I guess he just accepts all of that? Except we know he doesn't. This is just baffling. It's like Roger is the Tommy Wiseau of pseudoscience. Hi, babe. I have something for you. What is it? Just a little something. <laughs> Johnny, it's beautiful. Thank you. Can I try it on now? Sure, it's yours. You wait right here. Mm. I'm gonna try it on right now. Mm-hmm. Gonzalez Suarez says, certain theories predict that the dark matter interacts with normal matter by swapping Higgs bosons. If this is the case, a collision that produces Higgs could also create dark matter particles. And we did that. All right, my theory is extremely simple. They're looking for these W and Z bosons. And now we're on to another topic. This is Matt Powell levels of whiplash here. Pro tip for any Rogers watching this, W and Z bosons aren't Higgs bosons. That's why they have different names. Which is nothing more than the black and the white or red or green or blue particle, yes. No! Bosons, apart from some photons, don't have a color. Color is a wavelength of light or a combination of wavelengths in the case of purple. Only photons can possibly have color. Bosons don't just give off light. Some charts of the particle zoo are color-coded for ease of comprehension, but relating that to the actual supposed color of the particles in question is like a child asking what color Sweden is, because he's seen political maps with different colors for each country, and figures that that means that somehow, 
Those countries are actually that color. No adult should need this explained to them. And yet, here comes Roger wondering if W. bosons might be green. That's all that exists. When you start putting these back and forth together, you make other particles. Yes, the one thing fundamental particles are known for is being made up of smaller things, despite, you know, that being the opposite of what being a fundamental particle is. All right, this is the only ones that exist. And this one here is the glowy one, and it can be any color. Wait, I thought that electrons and muons are the only things that exist. Is Roger now saying that W bosons are electrons and Z bosons are muons? Again, they have different spin, mass, and charge, and further, they impart the weak force to leptons. They can't themselves then be the leptons they mediate the weak force for. But the black is always black, it's always the same size, same weight, and it's heavy as hell. Yet somehow two of them are needed to make up the zero mass photon. But also, if this were the case, then shouldn't the W bosons have little to no mass, and the Z bosons as much mass as a muon? Instead, the W boson is about 90% the mass of the Z boson, and the Z boson has less mass than a muon. Also, remember, muons and electrons both have negative one electrical charge, and the Z boson is electrically neutral, whereas W bosons come in both positive and negative charge. Also, remember that electrical charge is a conserved number, so you can't get to zero charge or positive charge by adding negative electrons. And, um, here's how they work out. Yep, I feel like these scribbles are what Roger sent all the physicists whom he complained ignored him. And let's see what's on this one, shall we? W and Z bosons are muons and electron neutrinos, which themselves apparently have color. Red, green, and blue are all the same as red. The W boson color is its impact value, or bounce, whatever that means. Apparently they also have a medium spin rate, whatever that means. Oh, but good to know that this is only the first draft. But also, let's see, we seem to have some dots showing us what things are made of in this chart of the standard model. So Z bosons, muons, and muon neutrinos are the same thing. W bosons are the same thing as electron neutrinos and the Higgs boson. Electrons are electron neutrinos plus a muon. Tau neutrinos and tau particles are both two muons. Gluons are electrons somehow. Now keep in mind that literally none of these particles actually have the characteristics that any of this would imply. I swear to Bahamut, I'm taking psychic damage from this. The W and the Z, that's it. That's all there is. I wonder how we get the half-integer spin particles, then. The Higgs is when they reattach together, when they are separated and come back together. Not the Higgs producing anything. The Higgs is produced when these come back together after being separated. I guess I was wrong about what he's trying to show on that chart. But then, how does that make the Higgs different from the gluon or the electron, which according to this chart, are also made up of a W boson and a Z boson? And also, notice how at no point has Roger bothered to explain or mention that W bosons come in both positive and negative flavors. They don't. Re they rarely see them separated, and they rarely see them coming back together. That's why the Higgs was such a big deal. It's not. We got them coming out of our ears. I'm sure that Roger has measurements of each of these bosons. He's just not showing them. These two particles together make the gluon. Which is weird, because gluons have no mass and no charge, but both Z bosons and W bosons have mass, and W bosons have charge. So gluons should also have mass and charge if they're made up of W and Z bosons. All right, the gluon is literally what we always thought was an electron. Again weird, since electrons have mass and electrical charge, unlike gluons, and they have different spin. How is it that a W and a Z boson can combine into two radically different particles? What makes the combination have half integer spin, negative electrical charge, and mass in some instances, but no mass, no charge, and integer spin in other circumstances? Now, that gluon, back to back, Two of them make the electron, I mean the uh, photon. Shoving two gluons together means that they somehow go from carrying the force of the strong nuclear force to carrying the electromagnetic force. That's... I'm not sure how to put it. So I guess unexpected is the nice way to say it. So we started out with these two. We got these to make the gluon, which is an electron. We got this, which is a photon. Now, the tau, the muon... Electron is the same as the gluon, so that cancels that out. Tau and the muon and these different ups and down flavors and so forth, they're all different impacts of these two particles. Since impact has never been defined, that means literally nothing. If this is the kind of thing he's been sending physicists, no wonder they don't respond. This is actual madness. It's like the thing you'd find in the lair of a cult worshipping the great old ones in a game of Call of Cthulhu. 
I'm honestly afraid for my own sanity exposing myself to this. You see, I'm a professional at looking at crazy nonsense like Young Earth creationism, and I can even handle Flat Earth. But this is a whole new level of dumb. This is like the cola super deep borehole of nonsense. This is the furthest into nonsense humanity has ever managed to go, and the heat is becoming unbearable. It's all this. When eggs push together at certain points, they create certain energy levels. And I show that somewhere here. Hold on. Oh, here it is. Oh, good. More crayon scribbles with no regard for reality will definitely make Roger's case for him. Except that, no, he gives up on the scribbles and goes back to Rod from Australia's cell phone pictures of laser beams. All right, remember this. The white particles have virtually no weight whatsoever. The black particles are extremely heavy. And you have two black particles attached to one white here. I'm just going to point out that all these things seem to be at nice, neat, right angles, which would correspond to the sensor grid of the camera. So we're looking at what is almost certainly camera artifacts, or potentially artifacts from compression, such as in a JPEG image. And what do you know that this image is in fact stored as a JPEG? Hmm, I wonder what this could mean. Pro tip, if you want to actually carefully study an image, save it as a TIFF file. It's lossless, unlike JPEG, and has way more color depth than a PNG. But with that, I think I can't take this anymore for now, so we're going to leave the rest of this for next time. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and put in the comments what you liked about it. If you didn't like it, hit dislike and tell me what you didn't like in the comments. Either way, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on all notifications with the bell icon so you're always notified when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Bent Hovind, Tapioca Weasel, Denny5252, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mabity Babity, San, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, Eloran Teller, Dr. Tapioca Weasel, and Pat L. Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get an access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if the annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.